everyone, I'm Kim Bremer, your host today for another edition of Bova News, keeping you up to date on the cattle industry's latest in technology, management, genetics, and more. The level of inbreeding in dairy cattle has been a concern for some time. Over the past few years, however, the greater use of genomics has impacted inbreeding percentages and raised the conversation to a new level, especially regarding genetic diversity. In today's webinar, we'll hear from two genetics experts who will share their thoughts and insight around inbreeding and their suggested path forward for the industry. First presenter today is Dr. Chad Dachau from Penn State. Dr. Dachau is a native of New York State and grew up on a small dairy farm that milked Holsteins and a few brown Swiss. He has degrees from Morrisville State, Cornell University, Penn State, and the University of Tennessee. Chad's general research interest is the development of genetic selection strategies to improve productive efficiency while maintaining genetic diversity and high levels of cow health and fertility. His current research projects include the effect of disease on telomere length, selection for cow health in organic dairy herds, genetics of feed digestibility, and characterization of lost male genetic lineages. Dr. Dekau has teaching responsibilities in the areas of animal genetics, dairy cattle selection, dairy herd management, and the use of dairy management software. He also co-advises Penn State's Dairy Science Club and is the coach of Pennsylvania's 4-H dairy judging team. Welcome, Chad. Thank you, Kim, and it's my pleasure to be here to talk about a little bit about inbreeding, some of the different perspectives that we have on this. I don't know, I will just state from the beginning that I don't know that I necessarily have all the answers, so it's good that we're at least having this conversation. And what I want to do is start by actually quantifying how much inbreeding we're seeing. So in this slide here, I plotted the inbreeding trends for all of our major dairy cattle breeds and kind of I've highlighted Holstein and Jersey a little bit thicker lines so we can see those a little bit more clearly and as you can see we 1960 is our base level of inbreeding and since that time we've accumulated about an additional eight to nine percent of inbreeding in our Holstein and our Jersey cattle populations. Now that number eight percent or nine percent I don't know that that's necessarily an important number at least not to me, what is important is the speed at which we accumulate inbreeding. Because inbreeding is going to happen at some level whenever we're doing genetic selection. And it's just a matter of managing it really. And what you'll notice on this chart is that there's kind of two periods where we see an elevated rate of inbreeding. The first period was during the 1990s. And then we see things leveling out a little bit, particularly for jerseys. And that was really interesting for jerseys because they were introducing semen and uh, genetic seed stock from Denmark during that period of time. So that added some genetic diversity and basically stopped the inbreeding trend. And then you'll notice after we get genetics in 2009, it didn't take too long before we start to see the level of inbreeding rising again fairly rapidly. Now, one of the things to keep in mind when we compare that earlier period in the 1990s to the later period today is that because of genomic selection, we're turning our generations over more quickly now. So when we do that, the rate of inbreeding on an annual basis, which is what we're looking at here, accelerates. And that's not necessarily we're, we're more really more worried about the rate of inbreeding on a per generation basis than an annual basis. So, but with that said, even currently on a per generation basis, our rates of inbreeding are pretty high. So one of the things that we can kind of do to quantify the amount of genetic diversity in a population is to calculate what we call the effective population size. And that is just a measure of the size of the population that's contributing genes to the next generation. So for instance, there are millions of Holstein cows in the United States, but when we look at the AI population and the amount of cows that are really contributing to the next generation, it's actually not that large. So, and that relates directly to the rate of inbreeding on a per generation basis. 
So what I'm showing here is just the effective population size. And as you can see, in the early 1980s, we were 150 to 250. That dropped down to around 50 or so for Jerseys, a little bit more than that for Holsteins. And then when we slowed inbreeding in the early 2000s, either because we introduced genetic seed stock from other countries, or in the case of Holsteins, we didn't necessarily introduce a lot of seed stock from other countries so much as our breeding goals shifted a little bit. We added productive life to our evaluations, for instance, and that introduced some new family lines into the breeding population. So then our effective population size grew again, and now it's back down to below 50 for Holsteins. And that level of 50 is what uh, a number that conservation geneticists usually look at to look at the genetic health of a population. They like to see that above 50, and we've dropped down below that level for Holsteins. So when we look at U.S. dairy breed diversity, we're currently at historically low levels, and inbreeding is rising as a result of that. It's not necessarily unprecedented. And because in the past we've had that as well. But the question now is, is there a relevant domestic or foreign reserve population that we can infuse into our breeding program to reintroduce genetic diversity like we did in the early 2000s? And there are a couple of implications that concern us about rising levels of inbreeding and less genetic diversity. Now, some of it certainly is that genetic recessives are more likely to result when we have high levels of inbreeding. Uh, but with our genomic selection tools, we have a, we're doing a better job at managing those. So I'm not too worried about that. I mean, I think we're going to continue to see some of those emerge, but that's going to happen. That's just a, a natural outcome of genetic selection to some degree. And now, thankfully, we have tools to help manage that. We also have inbreeding depression where highly inbred cows give less milk than we might expect otherwise. But again, I think we're managing that with the way that we do our genomic selections and we ad adjust for that to some degree in the PTAs for the bulls that we publish. So the, the larger concerns for me, there's a couple of them. One is that long-term, when we're talking about many decades worth of genetic change, that amount of change is determined by the, by the amount of genetic diversity in a population. So we might be compromising our long-term potential to some degree. And the second thing is that if we don't have a lot of diversity, it's more difficult to adapt to new environments and so forth. So this slide here, what I'm showing you is the selection limit relative to 2008 for protein yield. So 2008 is a one, which means that based on the effective population size in 2008, this was the amount of genetic progress for protein yield we expected to be able to make in the long term. And you can see in the early 1980s, because we had lower levels of inbreeding, we were in lower rate of change of inbreeding, we had a little bit higher selection limit than we do currently. So and currently we're about half, just since 2008, we've lost about half of our protein selection limit potential if we maintain our current levels of inbreeding. It doesn't mean that we can't go back and reintroduce some genetic variation, find some individuals that aren't contributing now. So it's not all doom and gloom, but at the same time, what this chart is telling us is that if we continue on this path, then we are limiting our potential. Okay, so I do want to maybe share just a little bit with you of another study that we've done here at Penn State, where we compared the progeny of 1950 sires that were mated to a modern dam to their herd mates. And so in this particular case, we, I wanna be somewhat cautious with this, and I'm only presenting this because it's going to lead into a point that I wanna make in, in the end. So we had uh, eight daughters of bulls who represented 1950s genetics. So these are three daughters of a bull named Zimmerman All-Star Pilot, who was an AI sire from the 1950s. We mated that particular bull for a 
different project that was related to the Y chromosome, so the, the male lineages. We mated those to some elite modern dams. And because we couldn't do sex sorting with the semen that was that old, we ended up with some daughters as well. And so those daughters remained in our herd and allowed us a chance to compare how those genetics did to modern genetics. And I almost look at these as crossbred cows. So they're really a, a cross of really old Holstein genetics with modern Holstein genetics. And we compare their performance to their herd mates that are close to them in age. And I just wanna share that with you. Their genomic predictions, of course, say that they should make a lot less milk. But we, what we've observed is actually the opposite. The lost Y lineage cows actually on an ME milk basis and first lactation and in second lactation actually were a little bit higher than their modern herd mates. And so that surprised us a little bit. Our goal was that we didn't want to have cows that were really poor performers, but we were expecting them to perform a little bit more poorly just because of the old genetics, but it was a research trial, so we were okay with that. But when we look at both a milk yield basis and a combined fat and protein basis, these cows actually did a little bit better. And when we look at a survival basis, basically they're about the same as well. So now I do not want the message to be that if we just use 1950s genetics, we can cross them with modern genetics and get even better performance than a modern genetic Holstein. This is based on a fairly small sample size. The point that I want to make, though, is that we can afford to introduce genetic diversity without seriously compromising the performance that we are, have come to expect. And so that is the message that I want to leave you with. It's, you know, I do not want to slow down genetic progress. We're making great genetic progress with genomics, and that's terrific. I think it's possible to make genetic progress without losing the amount of genetic diversity that we have over the, the last decade. With that said, we have some structural issues that make it a challenge. And so that will, will take some uh, coordinated effort to be able to overcome that to some degree, and, and only time will tell if we'll be able to do that. And then the last thing I, I want to just get in a really quick plug for a Discover conference. This is hosted by the American Dairy Science Association. This will take place in April of 2022. And what we'll be talking about here is managing genetic diversity for future dairy and livestock breeding. So it'll be, there's, there's a few people that are concerned about the level of inbreeding that we have. And this uh, conference is dedicated to trying to come up with potential solutions to help to have both the best of both worlds, maintain our current levels of genetic progress, but to protect genetic diversity so that we continue to make genetic progress long into the future. So thank you very much for your time and thanks, Kim. Thank you, Chad. Our next presenter today is David Kendall. David is a director of genetic advancement with ST Genetics, where he works to promote and advance genetic services and R&D developments. Prior to joining ST Genetics, he was a director of genetic development for Taurus Service and was executive director of the Brown Swiss Cattle Breeders Association and American Milking Shorthorn Society. He has also served as a past chair of the Council of Dairy Cattle Breeding and is currently a member of the NAB Dairy Sire Evaluation Committee and Inherited Biochemical Defects, as well as the National Animal Germplasma Dairy Committee. David's passion for dairy genetics has taken him around the world, traveling to numerous countries, all for the purpose of helping dairy producers achieve their genetic goals. Welcome, David. It's kind of always humbling to follow Chad and, and what I'm going to be talking about kind of reemphasizes some of the points that Chad has made during his presentation. So I want to talk about genetic gain and inbreeding in the age of genomics. As Chad noted, genomics offers the opportunity to increase the speed of genetic gain by giving us a more accurate analysis at an early age, of, which allows us to lower the generation interval. And that's a crucial point, lowering that generation interval. Unfortunately, one of the side effects of that lowering that generation interval is actually to increase the level of inbreeding. 
Let's look at a couple of examples. Begin with, let's look at the rate of improvement in fat and protein. On the left is, a, is the chart for fat, and on the right, the chart for protein. If you notice about 2010, when genomics came into play, the rate of increase in both of those traits, uh, the slope actually increased substantially. Genomics has definitely allowed us to improve the dairy cattle population at a much faster rate. If you look at uh, some work that John Cole did when he was at, still at USDA, John estimated that if we continue with our current rate of genetic progress by 2067, our cows would be averaging over 36,000 pounds of milk, 1,500 pounds of fat, 1,100 pounds of protein, 91 productive life months. They'd be a smaller cow with gorgeous udders, very fertile, and all that from continuing on the, on the current process of genetic improvement. But as Chad noted, inbreeding has increased as well over this time. And as you can see, again, the rate of in inbreeding has gone up substantially since 2010 in the introduction of genomics. But again, is inbreeding bad if production and other traits continue to improve? The reality is, is that as inbreeding goes up, we do have an impact in production and other management traits. So roughly for every 1% of inbreeding depression increase, we lose about $25 potential in a cow's performance in that merit. And a simple example of that, looking at bulls, is if you had four bulls that had an unadjusted net merit of 1,000, and you took off that impact of that $25 per 1% net merit, you would come up with quite a variance in what, how the performance of those bulls' daughters would be, the expected performance of those bulls' daughters from 825 to 750. There is a lot of genetic gain coming from genomics, but we do have an inbreeding depression. And when you take that inbreeding depression away from the genetic gain, that gives you an economic value. One of the problems for us is, is that there's many people out in the industry that are saying that there's some sort of magic level for inbreeding, that if you hit 7% or 8%, then you should not continue on, that that's the cutoff point. You should not make that mating. But the question is, if you're doing that, if you're limiting inbreeding, are you costing yourself money? The approach that ST has with chromosomal mating asks that question. Mating program goals are simple to develop a more profitable dairy farm. How do you develop a more profitable dairy farm? By increased production, improved health traits, longer productive life, improved fertility. A big difference in the ST program is, is that instead of looking at maximizing each individual mating, we look at maximizing the overall production for the whole herd and look at increasing the performance for the whole herd instead of looking at the individuals. To do that, one of the first steps we look at is we look at the predicted producing value, which is different than the PTA. The predicted producing value, similar to the predicted producing ability of CDCB and USDA, looks at how an animal is actually going to perform. Many people don't stop to consider that with the PTAs that we normally talk about, predicted transmitting ability, what we are actually discussing is how that animal's offspring will perform, not how the animal itself will perform. What we do is we look at how the animal itself will perform. And by doing that, we look at the genetic gain from the animal, what's gonna contributions from its parents, and then we look at the actual inbreeding and the actual inbreeding depression that's expected from that mating. And that gives us the PPV. Most modern mating programs just utilize parent averages. So if you have a bull that's 800 net merit and a cow that's 600 net merit, you have an expected offspring of 700 net merit. And then if that animal's 9% inbreeding, the program will kick it out. What we look at again is that genetic gain minus inbreeding depression to get the economic value. And so let's take an example of two bulls, Cobb and Jester. Cobb has a 756 net merit. Jester has a 758 net merit. If you mated these cat, those bulls to the same cow, a cow with a 447 net merit, if you were just looking at the parent averages, Jester would be the better mating by about one net merit dollar. 
However, if you looked at the expected actual inbreeding of the offspring, and you looked at the impact of that inbreeding on the offspring's performance, Cobb shows a significant advantage in the mating because the inbreeding of the offspring would be significantly lower than the mating of, than the offspring of jester in the female. In this example, about 10%, which means that you have an opportunity cost of $241 of lifetime income lost by using jester rather than Cobb. Another way to look at it is comparing three full brothers, in this case, Denver, Dion, and Drama. Denver has the highest net merit at 538, and Drama has the lowest at 488. Why is the genomic information critical? Why is having the actual inbreeding critical? If you look at these three full brothers and you mate them again to the same cow, with Denver's case, that cow would come up with, the offspring would come up with an 18% inbreeding. Dion would come up with an 18.5% inbreeding, and Drama would come up with a 13% inbreeding. And in this case, <clears throat> that means that the bull with the lowest net merit, but actually produced the offspring that has the highest income potential by $85 over their lifetime. So again, what we're interested in looking at is the actual impact of inbreeding combined with the estimated performance of, their, of the parents' transmitting ability to come up with a more accurate way to give you a more profitable animal. There's three ways to avoid leaving money on the table. First, it is crucial to utilize a mating program. And when we're talking about a mating program, we're talking about a mating program that incorporates genomics. If you do not know what the actual genomic profile is of your cows and of the bulls that you're using, then you're not going to have an accurate estimation of the inbreeding of those offspring. But if you have that actual optimization of the inbreeding of the offspring using what we call the predicted producing value, then you have the opportunity to actually control for inbreeding while maximizing your income, which is a goal. Now, this is not to say that there's a lot of issues related to inbreeding. We don't have all the answers. As we go forward, there's going to be more data accumulated, and there's going to be more discussion. One of our biggest concerns is this question of diversity. We can use a tool that we just talked about, but over time, even that is going to take away diversity. How do we maintain diversity? Chad mentioned the project that Penn State has been working on, utilizing the genetics from the 1950s. That's one alternative. But what other alternatives out there are there that we can use to improve the diversity that we're going to need for the traits that we don't know we're going to be selecting for in the future. Always remember the best way to predict the future is to create it by using the best tools we have available. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much. I think we want to start this discussion. Um, Chad, based on your study, to what extent is inbreeding to blame for this loss in production potential? Uh, would the industry be farther ahead if more attention was paid to inbreeding in the past? Well, yes, I think we would be, but it's really not about the current level of production so much as the future level of production and the potential that we have down the road. So you can attempt to completely avoid inbreeding. And if you do that, you will make no genetic progress. So at some point, inbreeding is going to occur. It's a matter of what level it's going to occur and how we're managing that in the commercial population. And, and Dave did a nice job giving some examples of how we can use animals that are less inbred to basically have superior performance. And we might think about it in the area of crossbreeding as well. If we cross two different breeds, we get improved performance. And so my concern is that if a, an individual breed becomes, loses genetic diversity to the point where you really don't have that opportunity available to you anymore, then, then the peer breeders are a little bit out of luck in terms of trying to compete with crossbreds. And as a peer breed enthusiast, I don't want to see that happen. So to what extent is crossbreeding a solution to managing the inbreeding in dairy herds? At the commercial farm level, I think we're seeing a huge increase in that. Currently, 
we're going to continue to see that down the road in the future, I think. And uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to turn the page backwards on that one. But in order for crossbreeding to be successful, we need good purebred lines or breeds as well. David? Yeah, the, I'm just echoing Chad to a large extent, but one of my, my concerns about what happens with crossbreeding these days is that it's really unfocused. And so people simply believe that crossbreeding is a solution to all their problems, whether it's production or fertility. And the truth of it for me is, is that the purebred breeds are making phenomenal improvement. You know, it, if you look at the rate of improvement in Holsteins and Jerseys in particular, it's astounding. And one of the issues that I like to focus on is the improvement in fertility and particularly in Holsteins over the last 20 years, which is a combination of things. Management's off sync has definitely contributed to it, but so has the genetic improvement. I think that it, it is, I think that Chad's right. I think crossbreeding is definitely here to stay. I do think it'll probably be expanding, but I am really concerned again that people go about it without really having a direction or an idea about what they're trying to accomplish. And instead of looking for continuous improvement, they look at heterosis as some sort of magic key to the whole thing. And if we don't have the purebred populations that continue to improve, then we're just going to end up with a mess as far as breeding populations or producing populations. So on a scale from one to 10, one being not concerned at all, 10 being highly concerned, uh, how concerned should producers be about inbreeding? And what should they be looking at the most? <laughs> so I guess it depends a little bit on what we mean by producer. If I'm talking about a commercial producer whose revenue is milk and they don't really pay a lot of attention to that, they like working with cows, but pedigrees and genetics aren't necessarily their interest, then I don't know that it's that high of a number, you know, four or five. On the other hand, if you're a pure breed enthusiast, if you're a Holstein Association member and you want to see the Holstein breed continue without having to source some of your genetics from another breed, to infuse genetic diversity, then I think it's an eight or a nine. And uh, so to me, it's, it's about kind of where you are in that commercial milk production versus a purebred breeder perspective. David? Yeah, I, I actually think that maybe, especially with the, the rate of inbreeding that's continuing to go up, that it should be a little bit higher concern for the commercial producers than that even. But I think that that again, it, it's important for those commercial producers to actually utilize all the tools that are available to them. You know, if you don't pay attention and you start suddenly creating cows that are 25 or 30 percent inbred and you start seeing a negative impact because you weren't paying attention, it, you could have a lot of problems. And with the current trend that's occur with that's going on in the industry where studs are becoming much more predictive of genetics, I think that there's a real potential for that to happen if you're not paying attention. Now, I, every stud is concerned about this, right? It, it, this is not like something that isn't discussed in every single office and every single lab around the world when it comes to the, the studs and genetic diversity and what's happening. But I, with Chad, um, normally I agree with Chad on a lot of stuff. This one, I think I'd be just a little bit, say that the commercial producer should be a little bit more concerned than, than that, maybe a six or a seven. Um, and I think the purebred breeders really have to be concerned. And I think the studs, the people who are actually distributing the genetics really should be the ones who are concerned the most of all, because we are the ones who, if something goes wrong, it's going to come back on us. So, you know, we have a real best interest in making sure that we understand what's happening and that we do it right. And probably you know, part of the reason I give a, a lower number to one and a higher number to the other is I do think the group that needs to be most worried about this is the group that's least worried about it. So I shouldn't say they're the least worried about it. They're the most hesitant to talk about it, I guess, as some of the breed association and, and bull stud level folks. The commercial producers know it; it's a problem. Uh, they have crossbreeding at, at their disposal. Pure Holstein breeders do not. Pure breed Jersey breeders do not. Yeah, but, but with that, Chad, I, you know, you're very cautious about the Y project, right? But the truth of the matter is that's opening up a lot of questions and may give us a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things that as an industry, it really is important that we explore those. 
the problem is actually having somebody to commit the resources to doing that. And that's a subject that we've discussed in the past and we're going to be discussing in the future, I'm sure. But well, and along those lines at the AI stud level, how do we prevent kind of today's solution and becoming tomorrow's problem? You know, a, a new bull comes out and meets all of the uh, requirements and metrics that we're looking at and then gets used everywhere. And then are we having the same discussion in four years, five years down the road? <laughs> the difference with that, Kim, is today that if the bull comes out that's really superior, there's only going to be one stud that's using it and one stud that's controlling the genetics. And that, I think, is actually going to compound the problem, right, um, to a very large extent, because there's going to be an overfocus and overemphasis on them in that one stud. And again, the problem for the, us in the AI industry is, why do people buy animals? Why, why do they buy genetics on them? To buy them on the metrics that make them money. And we can talk a lot about it. Um, they're so going to be the ones who are going to spend the most for the highest net merit, highest TPI, highest JPI bulls. You know, those are be, going to be the ones that are continuing to do it. And that's hard for us to get away from. You know, how do you voluntarily ask somebody to give up short-term profit for long-term viability? And most dairymen look at us and go, you do it. We're not going to do it. And how do we, how do, we do that? Exactly. He's hit exactly on the problem. That there's a, you know, it's hard to make ends meet now. So I'm not worried about men making ends meet in two decades. So, and, and I have great appreciation for that. Like I said, I think that we can actually develop schemes where we don't have to compromise now in order to make, maintain that diversity down the road. But it, it's tough because it requires a lot of cooperation. You know, the bull studs are in a very competitive market, just as competitive as the dairy farmers are. So it, it does create some challenges. I will say the one thing is that if the bull studs start using their own lines and protecting their genetics to the extent that they can, they will become somewhat more diverged from each other to some extent and allow a little bit of more variety potentially in the commercial population. So that actually has its pluses and minuses. There's a lot of unknowns. As somebody, I, as a pure breed enthusiast, I want to use the best genetics from wherever they come from and not have somebody can tell me, controlling how I use those genetics. So that part of it, I find a little frustrating, but that's the reality. Yeah, but one of my concerns, Chad, with that, and I think we've talked about this in the past, is I'm not sure that all the studs are actually selecting for different genetics. You know, you know it's, it's fascinating when you take pedigree stacks and we do our internal analysis and you know theoretically these two bowls are, are not related at all and they come out to be highly related as far as what SNPs they have you know wherever those SNPs came from it doesn't matter they're still highly related because they're going to transmit the same and I'm really not convinced at this point that the studs are actually selecting for different genetics and that 10 years from now there's going to be that much difference because we're all going down the same path for superior production, superior reproduction, whatever. And, and there's only a certain limited number of SNPs. I think it would, it would take, it's, it requires a much more sophisticated cooperation than is currently capable within the industry to look at that because we really need to look at, look at that variance within the structural architecture of the populations of each stud. Because again, I'm, at the moment, I'm not convinced that there's that much difference, even if it appears to be. I could be wrong, I'd happily be wrong. No, I, well, I think uh, you're, partly on target here, it's, but some of that is because we have a national evaluation system that's using the same genotypes from all the studs in their PTA predictions. If the studs are using their own internal predictions, it'll deviate the GPTAs a little bit more. That's true. So looking to the future, what I'm hearing both of you say is our industry needs to do a better job of managing inbreeding together. Would that be the best solution? That would be the, uh, from my perspective, that would be the ideal solution. Whether it, that's realistic or not, given the market dynamics, is a different question. For me, it's a slightly different phrasing of the question, is that we need to maintain the opportunity of diversity of genetics. The problem is, is how on earth do you document the value of that diversity 
as far as performance when you're working against a reference population. You know, this is that is a major concern. If we actually have stuff that we've selected against, we it's drifted out of the reference population and it's not going to be reinforced when we do the national evaluation. Maybe we can pick it up, Chad, on the internal. Yeah, that's it's a very good point. And it's uh, I I thank you for saying that because that's something that I really do agree on. But um, you know, I'm still I'm still more intrigued about using the old genetics or sourcing, using them as a touchstone, using those animals that are not in the genomic population. But again, that would require cooperation because the cost of it would be substantial. And right. And, and or better genomic methodologies. I'm not smart enough to know what those better genomic methodologies, uh, methodologies are, uh, but we are very aware that the frequency of a favorable allele has to be pretty high to detect that effect. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, a challenge that we have is that our current system is not designed to de detect diverse outlier pedigrees and reward them with high PTAs. You can really only get that through evaluating daughters. And uh, that, that day is, is come and gone. So, yeah. so it, it is tricky. And with better methods, maybe that will change down the road, but we're not there yet. Well, we look forward to continuing to follow this discussion and continue this conversation on such an important issue. My thanks to Chad and David today for joining us and sharing their invaluable expertise and experience. I'm certain we'll be following along in AD at ADSA in the spring as well, Chad. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Bova News channel on YouTube. Find our Bova News podcast on your favorite listening platform or find more information at bovanews.com. Thanks for tuning in with us today. We'll see you next time on another edition of Bova News.